टूडे माई गेस्ट ऑन एड गली एम ई इज मिस्टर अवीब होजानी ही इज अ नेम टू रिकन विद इन द मिडल ईस्ट इंडस्ट्री हिज डिस्टिंग्विश करियर शो केस इज अ वेल्थ ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस अक्रॉस वेरियस सेक्टर्स विद अ नोटेबल फोकस ऑन मार्केटिंग सर्विसेज मीडिया एजुकेशन प्राइवेट इक्विटी रियल इस्टेट डायरेक्ट इन्वेस्टमेंट्स एंड गवर्नमेंट इंगेजमेंट्स एज वेल एज द हेड ऑफ द बी पी जी ग्रुप सिंस he has played a pivotal role in overseeing the group's diverse interests spanning advertising public relation design activation media asset management and digital verticals in the middle east and the north africa region so thank you so much for joining us thank you thank you uh, so my first question like uh, would be you joined bpg uh, organization of the wbp pp in uh, 1991 when the company was in its nascent stages so how has the journey been till now well uh, when i joined it was called pan gulf publicity and 100% owned uh, by an emirati gentleman called abdullah majid al gore mm -hmm. in 1998 uh, we sold a substantial minority equity to cordian communications group which which formerly owned both brands Saatchi and Saatchi and Bates worldwide and subsequently they demerged and it was Bates so we acquired Bates Middle East interests and we became Bates Bank Gulf at that stage from from an executive I also became a, a, a significant shareholder and in 2003 when WBP acquired Cordian Communications Group globally uh, they inherited the minority stake in BPG So WBD is a significant but minority shareholder in the business. Uh, we consolidate into the global specialist services group, uh, and uh, in the past we've you know, prefixed uh, WBP brands like Maxis, like Bates, like Burson Masteller, like Conan Wolf, like Possible, but now we've just become an individual BPG. because a number of these brands have merged etc so we continue to stay independent and we continue to uh be our own farmers and hunters yeah that's great uh so like um i have uh, read that you did most of your schoolings and your education uh, from india yes, so absolutely. what uh, made you shift to dubai uh, so early in the life what uh, was the reason well uh in india i was fortunate that i set up my first my first in those days it wasn't called a startup it was mm -hmm. a company uh, it was entrepreneurship that i was working for late bal munkar in ulka and late george john and i did a white paper on building a challenger brand at a time when contract was just about uh, had just started and tarasina associates which then became uh, mccann had just started etc so we set up interface where i was the first ceo and managing partner back in 1985 it was a very heavy feeling that at uh, 27 to be to set up your own business was yes, quite something 3 years in and i felt that uh, somehow i felt uh, there were quite few regulatory issues in india then i'm talking back in 1988 and uh, coupled with the fact that my wife was an IT uh, services person in in valley she didn't want to come back to to delhi mm -hmm. so we decided to move to dubai and we have looked back since then yeah yeah yes wonderful uh over your extensive 40 year career spanning marketing media and so on uh what would you consider your fault what aspect interests you the most marketing advertising real estate Uh, what uh, is I, that your passion yeah I, i think there's a common thread across any of those uh, sectors and the common thread is helping get ideas to come to life that's that's what that's what tickles me that's what i enjoy doing every morning when i get up the never a dull moment and mm -hmm. perhaps one of my strengths is uh, to be able to join disparate dots and create white papers which hopefully create value but then for every 100 white papers i write uh, not more than one or two see the light of the day and for every one or two ideas that uh, see the light of the day 
the mortality rate is also high that not all of them create economic value. So, you know, so but that that doesn't prevent me from going ahead. Going on. Yeah. That's great, sir. Uh, Mr. Bhojani, as BPG stands as one of the largest marketing companies with an extensive client portfolio, how much credit for the company's success would you attribute to yourself being one of its pillars of strength across so many years? Uh, I, I, don't, you, yeah. Sorry, no, I don't attribute the success to me. I attribute the success to the culture that we have created. It, it is entirely about culture. Has everything else as creative, as strategy, as execution for breakfast. If with the right culture, you can climb the. You know, hardest of mountains and the wrong culture. You, you, you can't you can't scale a little little stream, you know, so you, it's culture that that's key. And that's my personal belief. Okay, uh, so could you share some light on the specific areas you oversee within the organization? Yeah, you know, if I may say innovation and disruption, I, I'm still heavily involved in. Mm -hmm. uh, key client relationships at the top level and top is not marketing director level, it's generally the either the owner or the chairman and CEO level. Yes, uh, I, I stay quite engaged with clients who want my engagement and clients who seek my engagement. Uh, and I call myself a non attributable overhead because uh, you can't attribute cost to me. I'm there when needed. Uh, occasionally, but then I'm not. Uh, if I attend a pitch or a client presentation, uh, the teams know that they need to run me past. All the thinking that is done and be prepared to pivot because I would not sit in a meeting that I personally don't agree with. So you know, that's. Uh, so I'm not a pure figurehead. Uh, uh, your contribution to Dubai's uh, strategic initiatives, such as the globally renowned Dubai shopping festivals, are noteworthy. What inspired you to initiate such developments across the Middle East? First and foremost, uh, I was fortunate enough to have been at the right place at the right time with the right kind of thought process. So back in 1995, uh, Dubai wanted to pivot. The leadership, there, there was a change and the current ruler then became the crown prince of Dubai and he wanted to change the perception of Dubai from as a place for the for the best price to a great place which is driven by quality and with international standards. And yeah. So I was fortunate that you know, we, uh, I had as a, in the form of a client, I had two, two gentlemen, one gentleman called His Excellency Mahmoud Ali Alabar, who then went on to build Imar, et cetera, et cetera. And another gentleman called His Excellency Mahmoud Al Garkavi, who was his deputy, uh, who now is the federal cabinet of his minister and possibly the most powerful uh, non-royalty in UAE in the government. So we're fortunate that we worked together as an extended team and uh, we did a lot together from the shop, from the Dubai Quality Award to the Dubai Shopping Festival, the Dubai Government Excellence Programs to the Holy Quran Award to IPOing of EMAR to the launch of the Knowledge Economy, that's Dubai Internet City, Dubai Media City, etc. And uh, so it, it was an interesting ride, yeah. That's great, sir. Uh, you know, this is because of you that Dubai is become such a. No, not because of me. I happen to be there and I'm benefiting from it. So yeah. I say I'm blessed that I was there at the right place at the right time and I had the confidence of the right people. And that's very, very important. Important. No yes. idea can come to life if the stakeholders don't have trust and confidence. You can do whatever you want to. And, and the thinking is different from today's startup world where. A PowerPoint generally creates 75 percent of value. So when, when a startup, uh, when an entrepreneur, so in today's context in the startup world, I think far too much value is given to the entrepreneur who brings the idea. Nine out of ten times the idea is not new. It's adapting to a different geography, and uh, which is why I think currently uh, there is a challenge in your know, 
LPs or investors mm -hmm. having confidence in, in early stock. stage or for that matter, even in the in private equity sector. So yeah. that's a different conversation. I believe that both with the venture capital industry and the private equity industry are ripe for disruption. I've done a couple of white papers on that because I believe that these industries are attributing too much value to themselves and taking too much value away and not attributing enough value to capital. Capital is, is still what moves things. If you start taking capital for granted, possibly like some of the big unicorns out of India have done in recent times, I don't want to name them, but some of them are very, very close friends as well. But uh, certainly there's a reset that is needed in the business model of venture capital and private equity. I used to think that the advertising agency business model was archaic. Mm -hmm. It had to reinvent itself. And I think 2020 and COVID has helped the marketing services industry pivot. And today the marketing services industry is perhaps more relevant than it was 10 years ago. I think the venture capital and private equity industry also needs to uh, unshackle themselves from the 2 and 20 model. That's a 2% management fee and 20% uh, carry. And a, a 10 year blind pool investment. I think there's going to be a lot more transparency needed and a lot more accountability on what is charged as fees and what is charged as carry. But that's a subject not in marketing services in a different domain. Uh, Mr. Bhajani, throughout your four decade journey, what transformations have you, have you observed in the marketing and adverti advertising landscape in the Middle East? Additionally, what are your perspectives on AI's impact on the marketing landscape and what are its pros and cons according to you? OK, one is I've seen the industry from the perspective of moving from print dominated, black and white dominated to moving to color from uh, blocks, maybe things which are alien to you that you know artworks used to be converted into blocks, then the blocks would be sent to the newspapers, who then uh, you know, print them to color separations to now all, all everything is digital now at the, at the flick of the button. And print is ceased to be relevant. Uh, some some print houses like the New York Times company have managed to reinvent themselves. In India, of course, uh, Bennett Coleman is doing a fantastic job, as are quite a few other print titles, because India is still traditional media driven and a lot less uh, digital media driven. It's print and television prime time plays a significant role. But the changes I've, I have personally witnessed is marketing services generally speaking, has gone down the food chain. Uh, when I started my career, the big advantage I had as an alumnus from IIM Bangalore, and a lot of most of my classmates had joined client organizations, they used to say that, you know, you get to sit to with, with our managing directors, and we aspire to sit with the managing director 20 years down the road. Oh, and as a young executive, I had access mm -hmm. to that because if you had ideas, they wanted to listen to you. Mm -hmm. Today, generally, marketing services does not play a role with with this with the top team, with chairman, CEO, unless there's an IPO situation or there's uh, public affairs or there's a public relations project. It often it does does not even get to the marketing director, and the marketing director perhaps is not on the C suite like in the financial services industry. The chief marketing officers are not direct reporters to the CEO. So you are at best communicating two levels below the key decision making in the organization. So the position that marketing services had, which was sitting alongside your trusted legal firm or your trusted auditors, is gone. And we need to win that back. So that's a huge transition that's happened. In terms of technology, yeah. Uh, it's it's moved to everything focuses on the custom experience. It's not about unique selling propositions or it's not about consumer insights. It's much more about the experience that the customer gets because the customer is hugely empowered now. It's like two days ago, I don't know, 
I think two, three last few days, Indigo in India or all airlines in India have been going through schedule changes because of weather. But the amount of negative ink that one airline has got in the last few days through social media perhaps has eroded a lot of brand value of that of, the, of that brand. So consumers have the power, a bad experience has the power of disrupting value. And that's something that we, and therefore it's customer experience at the core of every aspect of marketing service or marketing communications that you provide. That's because of digital uh, things that is. Uh, how has BPG's digital first integrated by intent approach contributed to the impressive growth in revenue? And what specific strategies or initiatives have been key to this success? So, OK, let, let me go back to you had asked a relevant question, which I didn't answer. What is AI going to do to our industry? So I, I genuinely believe that AI is not going to replace us. AI is going to make things a little faster, a little better, possibly a little cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, the other day I was having lunch with one of the world's most, most renowned pro prosecution lawyer from LA. He's, he's a guy, his law firm comes into play when there are huge intercorporate at a global level issues and when there's a suit filed. So the same question was asked to, I asked him, I said, I believe the legal profession, which is a lot based on precedents. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's precedent based, why do we need lawyers? AI will identify. So he said, yeah, on the law of contract, maybe something may change. This is just in simple terms. Let me say, tell you. Billable hours are going to change. Very little is going to change otherwise. Do we, will we need more lawyers? He says in US right now, there's there's an insatiable need for more law graduates. In India, it's a little other way around right now, from what I understand. But uh, similarly, in marketing services, I believe some tools, some processes are going to change. Just as when I started my career, we had art workers who would cut and paste. Yes. You know, photo type setting and create artworks. People who moved to the Macintosh stayed relevant. People who didn't became obsolete and moved on. Similarly, some degree of obsolescence will happen. But is the industry going to be impacted? No. Uh, let me let me come back to pretty much nearly a year ago. I was giving a keynote at one of the business schools in India, mm -hmm. uh, the Faculty of Management Studies in New Delhi, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Along with me was the CEO of Google India. And uh, we met the dean for lunch before the keynotes. And uh, the dean turned around and, and that was just about four days after chat GPT was announced. Okay. So the dean turned around and said, you know what? His personal belief that everything that's been taught in business schools yeah. is rubbish in today's content. It's all case studies based. So AI is going to knock everything off. What we need to focus on is creativity. So MBA should be MBC, Master of Business Creativity. Oh. So I'm saying the only professional service that has a license to innovate, to create, is the marketing services industry. The strategy consultants have been are, are told to fix problems. They're told to put processes. They're not told to think out of the box and come up with creative solutions, and they're not capable of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The financial services companies are also told to find ingenious ways of either raising money or deploying money. They're not told to create money. And all the services, the legal industry again, are not told to create. Is, yeah. Yes. We are the only industry that has a license to create. So you is it is it sunrise or sunset for us? I think it's forever sunrise for us if we interpret our industry rightly. So you are really enlightening me on these aspects. Uh, so I was just uh, asking that uh, how has BPG's digital first integrated by intent approach contributed to the impressive growth in revenue of the company? That's what. Uh, 
in you know, at the onset of COVID, we were pretty much devastated because our business model was traditional, that a lot of our revenues came from what I'd call arbitrage, which mm -hmm. is buying media and getting a percentage of that. And we used to also aggregate third parties medias because we are we're credible and we had scale and therefore we do that. Everything came, came to a grinding point. So we had to reinvent. So the, the digital first thinking is helping us. Number one, recalibrate our core teams, reprice ourselves and becoming re-relevant to our clients. Great. Uh, with the acquisition of strategic branding projects for first Abu Dhabi Bank and the new business wins from Bank of Dofar, Rag Bank and Suhar International Bank, how does BPG plan to leverage its expertise in finance and banking to further expand its presence and influence in the sector? Well, traditionally, we've been very, very strong in the financial services sector and in, in the banking sector traditionally from the days of Emirates Bank, which is now Emirates NBD. We were the partners for over, over a decade and a half. And anything that Emirates Bank did, we, we had a role to play in some form or the other. So as an agency plus in Kuwait with the National Bank of Kuwait and a few other banks, mm -hmm. uh, we are in a way overbanked. We've got more banks than we've got companies. We create Chinese walls and we make sure that each bank has a, de a bespoke dedicated client service team that does not uh, does not get access to information of other banks that we may be handling. Uh, that said, I think the banking sector where we need to take the next leap is the banking sector is ripe for disruption. Digital banks are coming in, physical banks are on the way out. Yes, we still have it. The currencies are changing. Tokenization is beginning to happen. We are beginning to get into that space. Mm -hmm. And hopefully over the next five years, success would be if we are able to move from physical to digital to digital. Oh, nowadays it is digital. Yeah, it's, it's still early days because the regulatory banks are not comfortable because, as example, crypto, what is the essence of crypto? that the yes. owner of that token is unattributed. Mm. You don't know who the person owns that, that particular token. OK, now if it's unattributed, funny money starts floating around. So, so it will take a year or two more to figure out how to clean and how to make sure that this token is not out of drug money or this token is not yes. out of blood money or this token is not out of whatever is extortion money or whatever it may be. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, sir, uh, could you provide some more insights into the BPG 3.0 initiative and its impact on customer experience strategies across Dubai, Kuwait and Oman? Yeah, uh, I think the best proof of the pudding is going to be in Saudi Arabia now, where we've just opened and uh, the president for our Riyadh operation is, is our chief CX officer. It's a guy called Wali Lakshmanan who has worked across five continents, uh, across including Latin America, which most, most people of Indian origin don't get that far. So Europe, Latin America, Australasia, and, 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 and New York. He's worked across. So we think that the future is going to be on we're trying to change the game rather than competing with other WBP entities or other Omnicom entities or publicist entities or interpublic entities or Hawass entities. Instead of that, we're seeing if we can possibly start competing with the Accenture songs of the world and the Deloitte digitals of the world and the McKinsey digitals of the world because they, they have access to more capital and effectively, if I may say, from an OPEX budget perspective, we're trying to get into a CAPEX budget perspective. Okay. So essentially, a piece of software, if it's developed, they can amortize it over five years. But a marketing program has to be amortized in that year. So, so you know, it's, it's a no-brainer. 
to, to move up the food chain. And that's what we're doing. OK, uh, so my uh, last question, because I know you are uh, running, we are running out of time, actually. So uh, you just start, you just said that Saudi Arabia is the you know next market for the Middle East. So how yes. has uh, what is the what is your plan as the, as a company to uh, for the development of uh, Saudi Arabia? So we we're in the process of acquiring a license as a fully owned company of uh, our mother company uh, without local sponsors or partners and Saudi today offers that. So in the process of the licensing and we're a few weeks away from getting the license, but you started operations. What we're looking at is only the front end is going to be there and we're going to operate back end through our Dubai operation or Kuwait operation and our global cloud services offering. So we've got people, 35 people working from North America to Indonesia at different places who are 100% of employees, but bound by a cloud contract, a remote cloud contract. So that helps us scale. So we're looking at uh, not trying to do all elements of the manufacturing of the customer experience idea in Saudi, but as long as the front end is there, so understanding the client requirement and delivering to the client and strategizing along mm -hmm. with the client requirement, the manufacturing can move to a lower cost center. So we've got uh, manufacturing agreements, software development agreements mm -hmm. with a company in Vietnam, with some companies in Eastern Europe. So where linguistically we are OK, where on quality of visual design also it's pretty good. So that's that's what we're doing. And we think that Saudi is is ripe for this kind of disruption. Yes. So uh, so I think uh, that would be all for now. Okay. And uh, I hope, uh, you know, like uh, we can uh, keep in touch and uh, do more of such interviews in the future. Okay. Yeah.